Juan Navarro um, um, told us to speak not too fast. That's a very difficult thing to ask from a southern Spaniard uh, like me. We tend to be very, very fast in speaking, but I will do my best. Um, there is no need to emphasize the, the, the connection between health and well-being on the one hand and uh, sustainable development on the other. So I, I will just focus immediately on what is going to be the center of my attention. And I warn you, I'm a lawyer and professor of law in a Spanish university. And then uh, you know that we lawyers are very provincial, parochial people. We tend to speak about law all the time. Yeah. Oh, it's better now? OK, thank you. Uh, you know that we lawyers tend to, to speak too much about the law. Uh, as far as you don't take uh, care of us, we speak about um, laws and rights, legal problems, litigation. This is what I'm going to do in the next few minutes. And I'm going to focus on a particular issue, which is the conflict between law and morality in the specific realm of uh, health services. That is, the conflicts between religious or moral beliefs on the one hand and professional obligations derived from what are understood in the many contemporary societies, especially in the West, is medical services provided very often free of charge by the state. The main problems, as you know, uh, began with the decriminalization of abortion that began long ago in, in different Western countries. And the things experienced uh, like, like a shift went from a purely decriminalization process or something that uh, the legislators in the West, or sometimes courts, like in the United States, thought that should not be touched by the criminal codes, it passed to be under the flag of reproductive rights, especially the reproductive rights of women, as something that should be included among the health services provided by states. So there was a transition from being a non-punishable act to be strictly conceived legally is a right to a service provided by the state. That was a big jump, but it has been happening in the West all the time. And a similar process we are witnessing today with regard to the euthanasia. It has begun in some Western countries, particularly in Belgium and in the Netherlands, and uh, so far is in the stage of the decriminalization, but more and more uh, there is a discourse, a legal discourse and sociological discourse about uh, um, conceiving it as a right to assisted suicide that one can demand from the state under the flag this time of the right to a dignified death. So it's not surprised that from the perspective of medical professions that uh, we have very clear in our minds that they are not just purely technical professions. They have a, every profession has an ethical side. But the, the medical professions, the profession related to, to, to healthcare, uh, the, this um, ethical dimension is not only particularly visible, it's particularly significant. And uh, is that is, that there is the reason why probably the, 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 what we call the deontological codes of the medical professions are so well developed in all over the world. Because um, uh, medical professionals, they are very aware that, it is that the part of their profession is to fight for human lives. So it's no surprise that when they face, many people face uh, physicians, especially gynecologists or nurses, or uh, sometimes pharmacists when it came to the morning after pill, um, they thought that, well, abortion is much more than just a way of contraception. It goes beyond that. And it touches, and, uh, from a different perspective, euthanasia is the same. It's not just a, a kind of a how to, 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 to finish my life with dignity. We are playing with real human lives, not just with human life in general, it's an abstract concept, but the human lives of real people, individual people. Uh, there is no, it is no surprise also that for the same reason, or for parallel reasons, uh, there have been a number of religiously inspired clinical institutions opposing to these kind of practices. And uh, so this has created the conflict. This so far is the discretion of the conflict, uh, how it emerged, in our culture, and naturally the challenge is what to do with it without trying to necessarily make it conditioned upon our legal judgment on the background issue. 
I mean, one thing is the conflict of conscience that a person or an institution experiences in the case of being demanded to practice an abortion or euthanasia, if that's the case. And we don't need to, um, in order to, to, to face the conflict of conscience, we don't need necessarily to have one or another position with regard to the substantive issue of should abortion be free or decriminalized or not, or which have the possibilities or euthanasia. So one thing is the legal solution provided, but instead the different thing is what to do with the claims of conscience which are based on a fundamental right, the right of freedom of conscience. Uh, there is a maximalist position that has been gaining momentum in some particular circles that takes, I, I call it maximalist because they take a very drastic solution. And the solution is, there is a public service, so you take it or leave the public service. Because if you are a civil servant, you have to, obed, uh, to, to be obedient to the law and what the law provides. And this is a kind of obedience that the people defending this position, which I don't share at all, uh, they claim, or they, they, they request a blind obedience to this type of laws. And I think, well, it's curious because the same kind of people that are now arguing that a public servant should be totally obedient to the law and what the state provides or not, they didn't take the same attitudes in other type of problems that also involved human lives, for instance, military services in, in different countries. Or, for instance, when they, uh, when they face the situation of what, what should a public servant or a judge do in cases of countries in which gender equality is not guaranteed sufficiently or at all. But they take, no, you should be resistant, you should be a, a, a factor of changing. Now in this case, instead sometimes, uh, the people supporting the maximalist position, they say, no, you have to obey the law or you are out of the system. You choose because nobody forces you to be a public servant. Nobody forces you to be a, a, a physician or a nurse in a public hospital. You can leave or you can have another type of profession. I, and the same problem is posed with regard to institutions, to private institutions, because in, in many countries, uh, the public health services are, have private institutions as intermediaries. So they provide the public service, but through private institutions, like it happens in many countries with education, with private schools. Uh, and then the position is, if you are not willing to provide as the most often the case, abortions in your institution out of the religious ethos of your institution, that in that case, we remove you from the list of institutions included in the public health service. And that creates a lot of tensions. Uh, for me, the maximalist position, I already anticipated it, is wrong. And it's wrong for three main reasons. Probably one can find some others. But there are th three main reasons that occur to me. One is, is based, the maximalist position, in, a, in an extended legal position of health that includes a vague concept of well-being that virtually covers almost everything that a person may want to include in his own legitimate, for the rest, design of its own, his own private life. So we, have, we don't use health in the traditional meaning. We have extended the notion of health to a well-being that can cover who knows what. And depending on that notion of health and well-being, we are construing, or we have construed sometimes, a parallel notion, expanded notion of medicine and medical service that goes far beyond the original and proper meaning. So the, the, the typical uh, medical service or medicine was supposed to cure lives or to preserve the, the health of a person in the proper sense, or to um, alleviate pain. But now, as we extend the notion of health, in parallel, we extend the notion of medicine and medical services. That is a very important factor to take into account, because um, I would, I'm not sure I have um, here, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have medical practitioners. Uh, they will correct me if I'm wrong, but I dare to say that uh, most medical practitioners from different professions, they understand the profession. When they think about health, they understand the term and the term medical service in the proper, traditional, original meaning, not in this expanded meaning that covers lots of things that contemporary Western states have agreed to include. Uh, the second reason is 
the maximalist position ignores the implication that these problems have from the perspective of uh, the sacrality of human life. In other words, they treat the problem as if it were just a technical issue. And these people refuse to perform this type of operation, like if we were talking about extracting a tooth of a person. We are talking something that is, for the medical professions, the, the very core of the profession, which is human life in general and human lives in particular. And again, I, I insist, sometimes I find this contradiction of people very aggressive against conscientious objectors to abortion, and at the same time, they are very favorable to people that are conscientious objection to military service. And I always wonder why, because both types of objections relate to the same issue, which is I cannot dispose of a human life. That's basically the reason. And the third reason, I, um, it's the, mm, the maximalist position ignores the implication of the problem from the perspective of freedom of conscience, which is a constitutional right in most democratic countries and also a right uh, protected by international conventions, by international law. Uh, this right includes the right to conduct my own life in accordance to my own beliefs, uh, religious or not, but moral beliefs. And uh, then uh, by this, radical approach or you give up your moral convictions or you are out of the system, we are forcing those people to take a drastic change in their lives. And curiously enough, in a society that is valuing more and more the right to the protection of private life, this aspect of private life apparently is not protected. So very often, the, the people support the maximalist position. At the same time, they have a very expanded notion of the right to private life in almost everything except religion or moral convictions. That is not part of, of this private life. It is everything. In reality, what it implies is a moral imposition of the majority. Laws are normally approved or supported by the majority of the population. And dissidents from these moral views when we, the objectors, conscientious objectors, if we leave them aside the system, then it's a kind of moral imposition. You have to agree with our morals because our morals are better than yours. But basically, there are, this is the subliminal message in this type of position, which is the right approach from a perspective, the, to make every possible effort to accommodate the conscientious obligation of medical or health professionals. Uh, the state may legitimately take the approach of making abortion or euthanasia part of the medical public service, but not at the expense of freedom of conscience of medical professionals. The state should imagine, should figure out other means to guarantee the services he ha it has decided to provide, but without damaging, which is a constitutional, a fundamental right. Uh, thank you. And uh, is, this is the position, and the, allow me to read it literally, because I think it's quite clear and quite precise. This is the position of a resolution of 2010, the, the resolution to, uh, 1763 of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. I read just the first paragraph. It's a very short resolution, but the first paragraph is particularly interesting. No person, hospital, or institution shall be coerced, held liable, or discriminated against in any manner because of a refusal to perform, accommodate, assist, or submit to an abortion the performance of a human miscarriage or euthanasia or any act which could cause the death of a human fetus or embryo for any reason. It's a very broad conception of conscientious objection. And uh, okay, and uh, um, just a final, a final comment on the, uh, I have explained what uh, we could be the conceptual reasons why I think the accommodation of conscience should be the point of reference. But we may think also of very practical reasons for the same conclusion. Uh, if we leave aside individuals, conscientious objectors, from the medical professions, we are leaving aside people with high moral standards, which are a requisite to be a good medical practitioner. We don't want, allow me the expression, domesticated medical professionals. We want people with real consciences, with capacity to think by themselves, that inject a serious ethics in their professions. And for the same reason, when it comes to institutions, 
Are we really willing to leave aside to exclude from public health services private institutions religiously inspired just because they oppose on religious or moral grounds to some type of newly conceived medical services, considering that it's estimated that between 30 and 50 percent of global health care is in the hands of private religious institutions? And in Africa or Asia, the figures are much higher. And also, it's not just a matter of the big figures. Uh, consider that in many of these institutions, rich areas, uh, marginalized areas or marginalized people that are normally more difficult to, to, to reach, to, to be uh, reached by, by state institutions because they, they get deeper into society. Uh, okay, uh, with this I can finish. Thank you very much.